Hi everybody, Ziv Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. Welcome to this video. And this is part two of how to handle a buckle defect. In the previous video, I showed you a case where a patient presented with a root fracture of tooth number five in a sinus tract and infection on the buckle, um, knowing that there is a very likely a compromise to the buckle plate. If you didn't watch this uh, first video, go back and watch it. So you have a little bit of the background and some of the key points to consider when preparing for a case like that. So in this uh, particular case, what, what I decided to do is give the patient systemic antibiotics, clindamycin, 150 milligrams, four times a day for one week, make the infection uh, go a little bit smaller, decrease in size, that, that, that's going to facilitate the extraction and bone grafting process, but also gave me some time to prepare for a provisional, gave me some time to plan the case, and I made an Essex retainer. Now, because this tooth has a class three mobility, the extraction process is very simple. I'll use universal forceps, extract the tooth with minimal trauma to the surrounding gingiva. And if you look at the extracted tooth, you can see the source of the infection uh, was a root fracture on the mesial aspect of the, of the tooth. And when you extract teeth with, that are cracked, that does not mean that two pieces will come out. Sometimes they do. In this case, there's a vertical root fracture that allows bacteria to travel along the crack and cause this infection. So correct, correct diagnosis. Now what I'm going to do, since this tooth has a crown, I'm going to separate the crown from the root, basically just cutting through it, and process the root for a dentin graft. More on that a little bit later in this video. Now going back to the extraction socket, there is still a point of uh, drainage on the buckle, but because the patient was on systemic antibiotics for uh, almost a week, the swelling has gone down tremendously, it was relatively simple to anesthetize the patient, and the soft tissue handling is going to be easier. So the first thing that you need to do, especially when you have large infections like that, you need to figure out a way to debride, remove all the source of the infection, all the granulation tissue from the socket. Uh, in this case, I decided to uh, drain a little bit more through the fistula as much as I could. And as I was doing that, I noticed that the uh, some of the infected material came through the socket. So we know that there's going to be quite a bit of infection in there. So you can use your spoon curettes to debride and just make sure that you're not making this sinus tract bigger. These instruments also allow you to gauge the shape and size of the defect. If you do it very carefully and just by tactile sensation, you can tell where bone is missing. And in this case, because the infection was uh, probably chronic for a long time, it was well embedded in there. And I noticed that there was a relatively large bone defect. So I decided to reflect a flap uh, to allow me to gain access to the defect and clean it properly and graft it properly. So uh, as much as we don't like to reflect flaps, sometimes it is necessary, especially for those blowout defects. The question is, what type of flap will you create? Uh, we have an implant on the distal. We are getting closer to the aesthetic zone the canine uh, lateral incisor area, uh, mesial to the, to the extraction socket. Um, many times a vertical releasing incision is a good option if you can keep it away from the aesthetic zone as much as possible. So I decided to make the incision on the mesiobuccal line angle of the number four implant because sometimes when you reflect a, a flap around an implant, you may get recession, sometimes there's a dehiscence around the implant, so I'm trying to avoid this by creating a vertical releasing incision. And then I'm going to carry the incision in an intracircular uh, towards the mesial and reflect the full thickness flap. And my goal in this incision design is to give me access to the buckle plate that I know is compromised, uh, allow me to debride the defect, graft it, and also then reposition the tissue back and have good tissue to suture you back to. Once I follow this incision outline, you can see here the view from the top. You see there's a bridge of bone on the coronal part of the buccal plate. And that's really good because this allows me to place a membrane if I need to. And these defects typically respond much better to bone grafting than 
if you don't have this bridge of bones, even if you have a thin layer, uh, anything helps. Now, if you look at the buccal part, uh, we can see that this bridge of bone is um, relatively uh, long, which is great. And we can also see now the nature of the defect, which is called a fenestration defect, like a little window. And you can imagine that once we have a full thickness flap, now we can debride the socket uh, through the socket from the uh, coronal aspect, but also through the window. So you can have a pretty good uh, clean out of everything that is in there. <laughs> Another thing that I'm seeing now is that the adjacent implant has a uh, also a fenestration at the apical part of the implant, which I did not anticipate or know about. And considering where I made my vertical releasing incision, uh, is not a great uh, not a great choice actually in uh, in retrospect because the worst thing that you you can have is a vertical release on top of a defect, on top of a, uh, a problematic area. You always want to make your vertical uh, releasing incisions uh, away from these areas, but I, there, there was no way I could, uh, I could know that. Your next step is to debride the socket. Again, use your spoon curettes. Uh, now you have an open access to clean it out very thoroughly, so you can then place your bone graft. In this case, I used a dentin graft, I used the root of the extracted tooth and ground it down in a, in a specialized tooth grinder. If you're not familiar with the concept of dentin grinding, you, you need to read a little bit about it. I'm going to make some uh, more videos. I talked about it in some of my previous webinars. Uh, but the idea is to take the original root or tooth structure and grind it down. This is the noise that it makes. And then you're ending up with a dentin graft uh, with particles of a defined size that I'm going to use as my graft material. Again, the rationale behind it and the, the whole concept uh, was described in my previous webinars and I'm going to talk about it more in future videos. To this dentin graft, I'm adding platelet-rich fibrin, what I call a biologic enhancer. I'm also making uh, platelet-rich fibrin plugs and membranes that I'm going to be using on the buccal defect. And now you can use this graft to condense it into the defect. You have full access, so you can condense it coronally. You can also condense it in a buccal direction. And once this is completed, you'd like to place something on top of the buccal defect. It could be a collagen membrane, or in this case, a PRF membrane, actually two of them, one layered one on top of each other to, I, I wouldn't say contain the graft because this membrane is not that rigid, but to create some type of barrier and again, biologic enhancement to make sure this site regenerates as best as possible because we're planning to place an implant between two and three months from now. The suturing in this case was done with a proline suture of 6O material. So I suture the occlusal surface First, then I suture the vertical releasing incision. The fistula is still there, but that's going to close up uh, probably within a week. So that completes the extraction and bone grafting process. I showed you how I use a, uh, a flap design that gives me access to the defect and how I debride it, how I process the two structure for a dentin graft and use the PRF and PRF membranes. Uh, to drape around the wound uh, all the way to the suturing process. As a provisional, I'm going to use the uh, pre-made Essex retainer. Uh, it's really simp very simple, very uh, cost-effective to make one of those. Uh, there's no pressure on the grafted site. It's uh, pretty retentive and easy to remove. And I think it's just a great solution uh, for these situations. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the implant surgery. And of course, I'll have to wait those two to three months. Uh, this is a recent case, uh, but I'll definitely make one more video on the implant procedure. So I hope you find this video serious, helpful. So far, feel free to share it with other dentists. Feel free to post it on your social media. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the three procedures every dentist needs to know. Uh, it includes the extraction and bone grafting as the first procedure I believe every dentist needs uh, to know and perform in their practice. It's happening May 23rd 
at 5 p.m. Pacific time to register, go to Surgical Master Webinar to register and uh, attend the webinar. If you're seeing this video uh, after May 23rd, there's going to be a replay, so wait for an announcement or contact me. So stay tuned for the webinar. This is Zeev Simon from Surgical Master. Attention general dentists! Attention general dentists! Hi everybody, Zeev Simon here. I'm the creator of Surgical Master. Are you feeling a little bit tired of restorative dentistry or frustrated with your surgeries? Do you want to build up your practice and develop some great surgical skills? If yes, you need to learn the three procedures every dentist needs to know. These procedures will not only increase your income, but allow you to deliver high quality care and convenience to your patients. With the proper knowledge and training, you can perform great surgery. I'd like to invite you to a webinar on the three procedures every dentist needs to know about. It's happening May 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Go to surgicalmasterwebinar.com to sign up. In this webinar, I'm gonna talk about the extraction process and bone grafting, as well as how I position the implant with CGI, computer-guided surgery, and then talk about crown lengthening, which is a very important procedure if you'd like to be good at surgery. It's almost like an entry procedure into the surgical world. So I look forward to seeing you at the webinar on the three procedures every dentist needs to know. It's happening May 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific time. You can increase your value because you know a lot more than you think. In this upcoming webinar, I'm going to talk about the three most important and common procedures that you need to know and implement in your practice. We're gonna start with extraction and bone graft. Uh, that I feel every dentist needs to be able to perform. I'm going to talk about CGI surgery, computer-guided implant surgery, where you can use the technology now available to every dentist anywhere in the world to place the implants safely and accurately. In this webinar, I'm also going to talk about crown lengthening, which is a very important periodontal procedure that I believe every dentist needs to know about. By knowing these three procedures, you can help your patients, you can build your practice, increase your bottom line, and have fun in the process. I'm super excited to share these three procedures with you. They're very simple, they're relatively low overhead, they're going to increase your bottom line, they're going to help your patients, you'll be compensated for them. So sign up for this webinar. Last time we had over a thousand doctors registering, we're expecting many more this time. This is Zeev Simon, creator of Surgical Master, to your surgical success.